you are thinking about a new solution that will not be implemented for sure this partition plan we reject as an impossible failure 19 years we have waited and now we have become endangered palestine is holy from hundreds of years past keep your conscience clean provide justice to the oppressed this partition plan we reject as an impossible failure think hard and make a decision we are sick of waiting perhaps the problem will be solved and the occupation ended and we can start organizing our country and be free in our land this partition plan we reject as an impossible failure no to the implementations of the partition plan long live palestine arab and free and may the glorious arab flag long fly over it these verses were composed by nu ibrahim who was the popular poet of the great arab revolt nu had been an early member of izzuddin qassam's organization and was given the title tilmiz al qassam that is student of qassam his rejection of the peel commission's partition plan for palestine as an impossible failure is easily verified by none other than ben gurion himself in august 1937 ben gurion openly declared his reason behind his advocacy for accepting peel commission's plan there could be no question of giving up any part of the land of israel it was arguable that the ultimate goal would be achieved most quickly by accepting the peel proposals i am dr hassan bukhari and this is the fifth episode of our series palestine versus israel at the end of the last episode we had discussed the arrival of a new british commission in palestine under lord peel to investigate the causes of arab resistance and recommend a solution to the palestine issue after months of meetings and recommendations in july 1937 peel commission issued its report and recommended a radical solution the report acknowledged the fact that the british had made conflicting promises to both the arabs and zionists during the first world war it also ruled out the possibility of jews and arabs coexisting peacefully in palestine due to their ever increasing mutual acrimony so the peel commission recommended partition of palestine as a compromise solution manifestly the problem cannot be solved by giving either the arabs or the jews all they want now that the hope of harmony between the races has proved untenable but while neither race can justly rule all of palestine we see no reason why each race should not rule part of it partition seems to offer at least a chance of ultimate peace we can see none in any other plan partition means that neither will get all it wants it means that the arabs must acquiesce in the exclusion from their sovereignty of a piece of territory long occupied and once ruled by them It means that the Jews must be content with less than the land of Israel they once ruled and have hope to rule again. The devil was in the details of the recommended partition plan. Jerusalem and Bethlehem would be under British mandatory control with access to the sea. About 80% of Palestine was to become a part of the Arab state, but most of it consisted of desert. The most fertile land along the coast and in Galilee had been allotted to the Jewish state. Interestingly, 90% of the population in the Arab state area was Arab, whereas about half of the population of the Jewish state area was also Arab. Basically, under the Peel Commission partition plan, the Arabs were going to lose Jerusalem, their cultural, spiritual and financial center. and the most fertile and strategically important areas of palestine to the british and the zionists the significant arab population of the jewish area would have to leave in a heavily unbalanced population exchange these facts made it almost impossible for any arab leader to openly support the peel partition plan 
only some like the Nishashabi faction supported it secretly and that too because their benefactor Amir Abdullah of Jordan supported it. Abdullah's support for the partition plan is easy to understand as the commission had envisioned that the areas allocated to Arabs in Palestine will join Jordan. Abdullah is not. If any Arabs were still willing to consider the acceptance of the Peel partition plan, they were soon dissuaded by the behavior of Zionists who made it very clear that the Jewish state's borders marked by the Peel Commission would only be accepted as tentative borders. Both Chaim Weizmann and Ben Gurion openly stated their opinion that the Zionists should accept the Peel Partition Plan as for the first time the demand for a sovereign Zionist state in Palestine had been accepted by the British. Both of them also clarified that they weren't abandoning their dream of turning all of Palestine into a Jewish state. They didn't feel bound by the proposed borders and were quite open to the possibility of future expansion at the expense of the proposed Arab state. So, unsurprisingly, the Peel Partition Plan proved to be a dead letter. With the failure of the commission, the Arab revolt resumed with much more ferocity. The violence started with the assassination of Lewis Andrews, the acting district commissioner for Galilee by Arab insurgents on the 26th of September 1937. Andrews was a very pro-Zionist British officer and a personal friend of David Ben-Gurion. He was also notorious among Arabs for using extraordinary repressive measures during the first phase of the revolt. So he became a natural target for the rebels. His murder was followed by a massacre of Arabs and mass arrests locally. Hundreds were jailed and tortured. This incident started a cycle of violence that shook British rule in Palestine. The British outlawed the Arab Higher Committee and most of the frontline Arab leaders either fled or were arrested and imprisoned in Sicilies. Haj Amin al Husseini managed to flee to Lebanon, but an important member of the Arab Higher Committee neither fled nor was he arrested. This was Raghib al Nashashabi, who now openly sided with the British in compliance with the wishes of his benefactor Amir Abdullah of Jordan. The Nashashabis even raised an Arab militia to help out the British and were labelled as traitors by Haj Amin al Husseini, who started ordering assassinations of important members of the Nashashabi clan. This split within the Arab leadership ensured that the rebellion would never receive effective and coordinated leadership from the Arab elite. Anyway, the revolt was a purely mass uprising and the elite had only reluctantly become a part of it. Despite a leadership vacuum, the sheer viciousness of the popular revolt testifies to the degree of resentment against the British and the Zionists felt by the Arabs. The British quickly lost control over a large part of Palestine and they had to fight tooth and nail to recapture it. Lieutenant General Robert Henning, commanding officer of the British forces in Palestine, said in 1938, the situation was such that civil administration of the country was to all practical purposes non-existent. Experiencing difficulty in containing the revolt, the British turned to the Zionists for support and they were only too happy to oblige. Zionists already were maintaining the Haganah as an active private army. Now Haganah became an arm of the British government of Palestine and benefited greatly by receiving weapons, training and legal cover for its activity. About 15,000 to 17,000 active Haganah soldiers participated in suppressing the Arab revolt alongside the British. A British officer, Ord Wingate, later to gain fame in World War II as the commander of Chindits in the Burma campaign and a guerrilla warfare specialist, trained Haganah troops in night attacks. By 1937, Haganah was dominated by labor Zionists and their rivals, the Rivianist Zionists usually avoided enlistment in it. But instead of wasting their energy by quarreling with their co-nationals like the Arabs, the Rivianists raised an even more aggressive armed organization named the Irgun Zwai Lumi. Irgun 
preferred to take the battle to the Arabs and it launched vicious attacks to intimidate them into submission. Ergun also specialized in conducting terrorist bombings. In a mere three weeks in 1937, Ergun managed to kill 77 Arab civilians by bombing the Arab marketplaces. The British and their Zionist allies exhibited all the classic colonial counterinsurgency tactics. More than 100 suspected rebels were hanged, many more were liquidated through extrajudicial killings, houses of families suspected of sheltering rebels were demolished, prisoners and hostages were used as human shields, and Arab commerce and agriculture were systematically targeted to ruin the already feeble Arab economy. Still, the rebels continued fighting. The British had to bring two divisions of crack troops and squadrons of bombers to pound the Arabs into surrender. According to the historian Richard Overy, the conflict in Palestine was the largest military undertaking by British forces between the two world wars and the tough repression of the insurgency resulted in at least 5,700 Arab dead and 21,700 seriously injured, imprisonment without trial, and a blind eye to torture by the security forces. It is estimated that 10% of the adult male Arab population was killed, wounded, imprisoned, or exiled between 1936 and August 1939 when the rebellion finally fizzled out. Around 700 British soldiers and more than a thousand Jews were also killed or wounded during the revolt. At the end of this episode, two important questions need to be discussed. One, why did the Arabs lose despite giving huge sacrifices and showing tremendous elan? Two, what were the effects of the Arab revolt? The causes of the decisive Arab defeat are many. But I will discuss the four most important ones here. First, the Arabs were plagued by poor planning. Their military and political strategy left much to be desired. Before embarking on the revolt, they had failed to take account of their strengths and weaknesses. The Arabs' greatest strength lay in their overwhelming numerical superiority. Militarily, they were much weaker than both the British and the Zionists. They didn't have any safe haven for guerrillas outside Palestine as all the neighboring Arab countries were under complete French or British domination at that time. So, they couldn't fight either a conventional war or a protracted guerrilla campaign against their foes with a reasonable chance of success. On the other hand, had they chosen the strategy of non-violent protests similar to Gandhi in India, they might have garnered more success. By choosing this strategy, they could have accrued political benefits by gaining sympathy even in Europe and the USA. They could have exposed the British and Zionists for the ruthless imperialists they were. The strategy would also have allowed the Arabs to create and maintain robust political organizations without being crushed by the British military utterly. And this brings us to the second pivotal reason of the Arab defeat. The fragmented, harebrained, and selfish Arab leadership. The Arab revolt was a spontaneous outburst. The people lost patience and revolted after enduring two decades of oppression while the elite which was supposed to fight for them was either looking after its own interests or was busy in infighting. After the beginning of the revolt, the fragmented Arab leadership precluded any possibility of unified control over the rebels. This led to a lack of coordination among different rebel factions and severely handicapped them. A lot of energy was wasted in the fratricidal Husseini Nashashabi conflict that left hundreds of Arabs dead by Arab hands. The Zionists, despite having bitter disagreements among themselves and possessing a position of advantage, never lost their mutual synergy in the war against the Arabs. But the Arab leaders, despite facing almost impossible odds on the battlefield, could never rise up over their petty squabbles. The Nishashibi faction especially behaved like a group of quislings and damaged the Palestinian resistance by serving as an agent of the British and Amir Abdullah of Jordan. 
The third reason for the Arab defeat was a paucity of training. Apart from Izzuddin al-Qassam, no Arab leader had seriously tried to organize and train Arab youths for a possible armed conflict. On the other hand, most of the Zionist youth, both male and female, had received some military training. The British could count on a very professional and well-armed army. So predictably, when the untrained Arabs faced the British and Zionists in the field, they performed poorly and suffered heavily despite their valor. This lack of training also meant that the few competent Arab leaders had to take a disproportionate number of risks. Consequently, these few able men became casualties further weakening the war. The Arabs could ill afford this loss. On the other hand, the Zionists and British escaped the hemorrhaging of military talent in the field because of the professional nature of their armed forces. Lastly, the Arabs' economic and financial weakness meant that they couldn't support the fighters in the field and their families at home for a prolonged period, they couldn't procure arms and ammunition in sufficient quantities, and they couldn't even create significant organs of propaganda both inside and outside Palestine. The Zionists vastly surpassed the Arabs in economic power and hence did all the aforementioned tasks much more successfully. Now, I will briefly discuss the effects of the Great Arab Revolt. Palestinian historian Rashid Khaldi states, In spite of the sacrifices made, which can be gauged from the very large numbers of Palestinians who were killed, wounded, jailed or exiled, and the revolt's momentary success, the consequences for the Palestinians were almost entirely negative. There can be no doubt about the fact that the defeat of the revolt severely hobbled the Arabs in the triangular struggle for control of Palestine. Among the three sides, the British weren't rooted in Palestine at all, and it was clear to everyone that sooner or later they will have to vacate Palestine. But both the Arabs and Zionists claimed Palestine as their eternal homeland. Ultimately, it was always going to be an Arab versus Zionist contest, a face-off between Palestine and Eretz Israel. The Arabs fell much behind the Zionists after the revolt. They were already weaker. But the revolt converted the gulf between them and the Zionists into an unbridgeable sea. Already short of able leadership, valuable human element was sacrificed for little gain. Men like Abdul Rahim Muhammad al-Saif, Izzaduddin al-Qassam, Nuh Ibrahim, Farhan al-Sadi and Yusuf Abu Dara were lost and few if any replacements were to be found. Only some capable leaders like Abdul Qadir al Husseini and Fauzi al Kaukji survived the revolt and featured later in the first Arab Israeli war a decade later. In contrast, the Zionists experienced a boost in both human and material resources. Thanks to British patronage, they were able to procure massive amounts of arms and train thousands of Jews in combat. The Haganah and Irgun became the conventional and unconventional military arms of the Zionists and served them well in the tumultuous years to come. Future key Israeli military leaders like Yitzhak Sadeh, Moshe Dayan and Yigal Alon gained practical experience and honed their ability. Reuven Shiloa, the first director of Mossad, learned his craft by working for British intelligence during the revolt. In short, After the Arab revolt, the Zionists could confidently look forward to military conflict with the Arabs and realistically hope for a decisive victory in that conflict. The realization of Herzl's dream appeared nigh. But the revolt did bring forth a positive outcome for the Arabs as well. In Palestine's triangular struggle, the British only wanted to gain strategic benefits for as long as possible and were even able to align with any side for that aim. With a new world war visible on the horizon, the British were forced to reconsider their choice of allies in Palestine as the revolt winded down. Both Germany and Italy were pushing anti-British and anti-French propaganda in the Middle East and the Arabs were receptive. 
The colonial powers, avarice and cruelty were huge factors here, but even more important was the British backing for Zionists. The Arabs hated the British for firmly planting the Zionist dagger into the heart of the Arab world. The religious appeal of Al-Quds Sharif and the danger of Jerusalem falling to Zionist colonizers made the Palestine issue the emotional center of gravity of the Arab populace, if not the leaders. In a war against rapidly anti-Jewish Nazi Germany, the Zionists had no choice but to fight for the British. But millions of Arabs all over the Middle East could easily choose to side with the Germans, get help from them, and launch a much more vicious and widespread revolt than the one just quelled in Palestine. This possibility gave nightmares to the British government. If we must offend one side, let us offend the Jews rather than the Arabs, said Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain in April 1939. The year 1939 brought new uncertainties to Palestine despite the end of the Arab revolt. The Zionists had little to celebrate. A German victory in the World War would surely mean the end of the Zionist project. But the British, their erstwhile protectors, now also seemed a bit aloof. The Arabs were also on a low ebb after the beating they had received during the revolt, but some of them were hopeful to retrieve the situation with the help of either the British or the Germans. The British wanted to hold on to Palestine during the war at all costs because the loss of Palestine would mean the severance of their main geographical line of communication with their restive but pivotal Indian colony. In the next episode of Palestine vs Israel, we will discuss the post-revolt developments and major events that occurred in Palestine during the Second World War. Stay tuned. Kindly don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.